Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we come together for our Sunday evening time as we look and continue to look at the book of Joshua. We'll be looking at chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. So I invite you to turn there in your copies of God's Word to Joshua chapter 10, beginning there at verse 1. And as y'all are, are turning there, let's go ahead and go to the uh, Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for another opportunity to study your word, to consider your ways, and to be thankful for your mercy. To God, we pray as we come here in the book of Joshua that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, tonight, again, we're in Joshua chapter 10. We're continuing with the invasion of the land, and we continue to hear of Israel's interactions with the people of Gibeon. So let's turn there to verse 1 of chapter 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king. So he had done to Ai and its kingdom, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. But they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. And because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty, Therefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hohan, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Deborah, the king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me that we may attack Gideon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly, save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Haran, and struck down, them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Haran that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still over Gideon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Amen. Well, now we see that having heard of the peace that Gibeon had made with Israel, that no good deed goes unpunished. We see here that these Gibeonites who have allied themselves with the people of God have now seen their former friends come against them. And this should not be surprising to us as believers. We see this not only in the New Testament, but we have lived experience in this regard. Especially those of us who came to faith as adults will remember what it was like when we came before our friends and told them that we now were under the command of the Lord Jesus, that we no longer could go with them to the beer joints or wherever, that we no longer were going to walk in that manner of life. I'm sure that you had conversations with uh, friends that ended poorly because they could not understand why you no longer wanted to go where they were going. And the situation is similar here with Gibeon. Their former friends, the nations of the land, 
seeing that they have come and made this pact with the people of God, now want to destroy them. They want to make sure that they are punished for their uh, going astray from the ways of the world. And again, we shouldn't be surprised at this considering what we see when this takes place in the book of Acts, for example. In the book of Acts, in chapter 16, we have a certain slave girl who was possessed with a spirit of divination. And she brought much profit to her masters through her fortune telling. And Paul heard her crying out, saying to them, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. And Paul was greatly annoyed at her because she was saying this in a way that was mocking and in a way that was trying to bring unneeded attention to the apostles. And so Paul turned, says to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And we're told that the spirit came out that very hour. But... Notice what happens because she now no longer serves the devil, but now is a servant of Christ. After that, we hear that her master saw that their hope of profit was gone. So they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace to the authorities. And that story in the book of Acts continues that, and it tells us that they were tried and there was an attempt on their life because they had taken this woman that once was a tool of the devil and made her now a, uh, a servant of the Most High God. And we see this again here in Joshua chapter 10. So these kings gather together and attempt to destroy Gibeon. And one of the things we see, of course, in this passage is that no matter how great the armies allied against the people of God are, they will be destroyed. Now we see something else happening here as well. We see the Lord commending Joshua to keep the word that he made to the Gibeonites. If they are going to be his servants, well then he has a duty to them. If he is their master, then he must watch out and care for his servants. This is the basic teaching of the fifth commandment. One of the ways in which our catechism lays this out is that they style men like Joshua as a superior. And as a superior, he has responsibilities to inferiors. Now, when the catechism uses that language of superiors and inferiors, it is not saying that one is worth more than the other. It's merely a statement of place, of role. And Joshua, being the superior, is required by God to make sure that all of those under his command, whether they be Jews or Gibeonites, are protected from enemies that are coming against them. And so God, hearing these things taking place, tells Joshua not to be afraid that the Lord is going to allow them to be destroyed. And one of the things we see in this passage is that God does so in different ways. Now, it's interesting that Joshua tells us that more of the people were killed by the hailstones than by the sword of Joshua. Now, why is that the case? Again, thinking here broadly of the beginning of this passage, why is that told to us? It is a sign and a reminder both to the Gibeonites and to Joshua and to the armies allied against them, that this destruction has come by the hand of the Lord. That this judgment is by God's providential, his creative hand. Now, why is that important? Well, again, the people of this era were much more attuned to the natural world than we are. We always have a human or uh, scientific explanation for things that take place. 
We do not speak in the way of God's judgment in the midst of natural disasters like they would have in these days. And again, that is to our detriment. Uh, that's not, again, placing us above the men of the days of Joshua. We are the ones who fail to see reality for what it is. You know, that's one of the things that I've mentioned several times about this whole year that we've been under during this uh, coronavirus time. I have said many times that I believe this is the judgment of God that God has brought judgment down upon the world, but especially our nation. He's shown the fools to be what they are. And he has also uh, brought witness to the idols of this age. It's not accidental that the things that were taken away from us are the things that overwhelmingly take up our time. And again, we need to be wise enough to see that that's what the Lord was doing. But unfortunately, we have not seen much repentance in the ways of idolatry in the, in the nation in regards to this. And one of the things that we see when the nation of Israel or the Gentiles do not recognize the Lord's hand is what does the Lord do next? The Lord brings an even greater judgment down upon the land. And we better be watchful for these things. Now, what does that have to do again here with Joshua chapter 10? Well, again, the nations should have learned from the example of Jericho, of Ai, and especially the Gibeonites. Would it not have been more wise for the, the Adonai, Zedek, and the other kings to do the same thing that the king of Gibeon had done? What is the state of Jericho at this point in Joshua chapter 10? It's laid waste, it's destroyed. What is the state of Ai? It is destroyed. What does Gibeon look like right now? Nothing has happened to Gibeon. In fact, now Gibeon is being protected from the other nations all because they submitted themselves to Joshua and to Joshua's God. Now, if you are, if you style yourself to be a smart person, what would you rather be? Would you rather be Gibeon, a servant of Joshua, or would you rather be the king of Ai, rotting in your grave? Well, again, a wise man would want to be Gibeon, but we're not dealing with wise men because we're dealing with men who are in rebellion against the Lord, our God. And what do we see from men who are in rebellion? That they do not want to recognize their rebellion. This is similar, of course, to the way that we see the nature of men's hearts laid out for us in Romans chapter 1. When they are confronted with their sin, what do they do? They double down on their sin. They triple down on their sin until God gives them over to their passions, gives them over to their lusts, gives them over to their licentiousness. And then they are destroyed by that sin. And we see that here with Adonai Zedek, with the other kings. In their pride, their arrogance, in their evil, they lose everything. Whereas the king of Gibeon is sitting well and comfortable in his home while the Lord takes care of those who have allied themselves against him. Again, and this is a key thing for us to remember and for us to think about as we walk on our own paths of righteousness. We can look at the examples that we have in the scriptures. Notice once more that the people of God are the ones who come out on top. That the people of God are the ones who come out victorious in the midst of all the things that take place here in Joshua chapter 10. Now, think of Paul and Silas and as they are being uh, taken here in Acts 16 in this whole scene with the woman who had a demon, who Paul had released from that demon. They were seized and dragged in the marketplace to the authorities. They were put in chains. They faced great judgment.
because of all of these events. But remember what else happens here in Acts 16. Here is where we learn of the Philippian jailer. Here we see the Lord and his providence allowing Paul and Silas to go through this so that the Philippian jailer and his family would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is another reminder that the Lord's ways and the Lord's providences are not always how we would draw things up. I'm sure Paul and Silas, if they were honest, would say they would much rather have you know, met the Philippian jailer for coffee somewhere and talked to him about Jesus rather than having to stop him from killing himself and going through all of the other things that happened there in the jail with the earthquake and all the other things. But that's not, again, how the Lord had laid it out from the foundation of the world. And one of the signs, again, of true faith is recognizing this reality of humbling ourselves under the Lord's providence. And we see that here in Joshua chapter 10 with, again, how Joshua approaches this whole scene. We see Joshua as he is trying to figure out what to do, that Joshua goes to the Lord to seek his wisdom. And here Joshua has learned something from his failures in the last chapter, where we first learned of this whole pact, this whole covenant with the people of Gibeon. He goes to the Lord and the Lord speaks to him and says, do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So we see here again, the Lord has promised to Joshua victory over his enemies. And Joshua goes out and does likewise. Now, and then we have one of the uh, most interesting uh, couple of verses in the whole Bible, where Joshua, seeing that there was more to be done, spoke unto the Lord and said this in the sight of Israel. Sun stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Now notice again what Joshua is asking. Joshua is asking for daylight to be extended. And the Bible tells us that's exactly what happened, that the sun and the moon stopped in their tracks. Now, we shouldn't have any trouble believing that this took place. And why should we have no trouble believing this took place? First of all, because that's what the Bible records happened. And we trust in the authority, the veracity, and the truthfulness of what's recorded in Holy Scripture. So we know that it took place because the Bible records it. But how else do we know that that is the case, that this actually took place because again there is a reference here to another book the book of Jasher now there is a lot of questions as to what exactly the book of Jasher is but again Joshua is saying look if you don't believe me go con go go read this book of Jasher go go see it for yourself and of course then also Joshua could say hey go talk to any other people that were there that day they will confess and tell you that this is the case. This is similar to what, the, uh, what Luke does in the writing of his gospel and of the book of Acts. Remember there, as he introduces the gospel of Luke, he tells uh, Theophilus that he came there for the purpose, or wrote that book for the purpose of showing him illustrating to him, telling him about all the things that had taken place concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he had any questions about it, that he could go talk to the people who are mentioned in these books. And so we see Joshua here again referencing this reality so that the Lord's judgment could be fulfilled. And we hear here that the Lord honors this statement and we hear that in verse 14. It says, And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And there's an important point to hear in what Joshua has recorded for us. Why did the sun stand still? Because the Lord fought for Israel. 
If Joshua had asked the sun to stand still so that he could play outside for another few hours with his friends, the Lord would not have honored that request. But here we see again something that Jesus talks about in the Gospels, about the nature of prayer, about the nature of faith in trusting in the power of God to move mountains if possible. Now, that doesn't mean that if you go out tonight and pray that the Lord would move Crowder's Mountain another 100 feet to the west, that it's going to go happen. Right? That's not what Jesus means, and that's not what we're meant to learn from the book of Joshua in this scene. What we see here again is that the Lord will do all things in his power to accomplish his will. Again, this is the nature of our God. He is the God over creation and providence. And these things have been ordained from the foundation of the world that we might see again the power of Jehovah. Now, as we close tonight and as we think some more about all the things that are happening here in this passage, for there is a lot of things taking place. Again, the central message here is the fact that the Lord God is God over all things. He's God over the hail. He's God over the witness of the Gibeonites. He's God over the destruction of the enemies of Israel. And he, he is God over all these things again because he fights for his covenant people. Again, the assurance that we're meant to draw out of these 15 verses is that reminder that we have nothing to fear from the enemies of the gospel. That we have nothing to fear from those who would turn away from us. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is the scene in John chapter 9 with the man who was born blind. Remember there at the beginning of that chapter, we have the man born blind and Jesus is going to heal him. And the disciples turn and ask Jesus, well, did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? And Jesus turns to them and says, no, this man was born blind so that the glory of God be shown in him. And we see after he is healed, he goes and what's the, what does he do? He goes and he's brought in front of the, of, the, uh, of the Pharisees, in front of the Sanhedrin, and they question him about this stuff. And what is his initial reaction? That he thinks that the Pharisees want to know more about Jesus. But it turns out that that's, the opposite of the reality. In fact, they eventually drag his parents in front of the Sanhedrin. And what do his own parents do in John chapter 9? They abandon their son. They act like they don't even know him. They leave him to the enemies. But what happens at the end of John chapter 9? Jesus goes and finds this young man. And he comes and he worships the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's a keen reminder of the reality of who we are in Jesus Christ and what we have in the family of God. We may be abandoned by friends and family when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We might be hard done by the world if we turn away from wickedness and evil. But what is our comfort and what is our peace in the light of all of these things, is that the Lord fights for Israel, that the Lord fights for his church, that the Lord has already won the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ for his covenant people. And so we have nothing to fear from the enemies of God. Because remember again, the key part of that phrase, enemies of God. What foolishness is it to fight against the living and the true God? But that's exactly what they're trying to do. And they will face the same destruction that we see from Adonai Zedek and the other kings here in Joshua chapter 10. So we are to learn and to heed the example of what we see from Joshua and from the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites, in their time of trouble, they call out to their master. Who are we to call out to in the day of our trouble? But our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ will hear our cries. He will hear our pleas. He will answer our prayers. 
Let us again remember the blessings here of Joshua 10 as we continue to seek to live and keep the king's command for the sake of our oath to God. Take care. God bless. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again that you have given us time to come and to study your word and to think through the uh, goodness of your grace that we see exhibited here in Joshua chapter 10. May Jesus Christ continue to be with us. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.